Proverbs chapter um, 17, verses 1 to 5, and then we will jump from verses to verses uh, 20 and 22. So Proverbs 17, uh, uh, from verses 1 to 5. Anyone who is there, and I will ask that we, we just be ready to read because we'll be reading several passages, and so I would like to have uh, uh, people participating. Yes, Hera, thank you for volunteering yourself. Thank you, thank you, Hera. Uh, someone else, uh, verses 20 and to 22. Same Proverbs 17, 20 to 22. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. So notice in the two proverbs, in the two uh, portions of that proverbs, there's something that we are being reminded of. Notice verse 1 of 17, better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. So in other words, the, the Solomon, as he writes these proverbs, he is reminding us of the peace that should exist, of the the unity that should exist where there are fellowship of uh, people, whether it is in a home or wherever, there is need for kind of, of peace. But when we turn to verses uh, 20 and 22, we are told a, a man of crooked heart does not discover good, and one with a dishonest tongue falls into calamity. He who serves a fool gets himself sorrow, and the father of a fool has no joy. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. So three things that I want us to look at uh, at, at forefront as we move ahead is one, we are being reminded of how we can live in sorrow, or how our hearts can be filled with sorrow if these three things happen. One, if, there is, if we are crooked and dishonest in life, that will lead to sorrow. Um, secondly, we will see that when we have, um, let me use Solomon's uh, word, a son who is foolish will also bring sorrow to his father. And then lastly, too much discouragement in verses 22 will also bring sorrow. So notice, therefore, as we think about the necessity of wisdom, wisdom will lead us to live a life without sorrow. Not that we will not have problems, but we will be evading obvious things that will bring sorrow into our hearts. And that is what uh, Solomon tells us in verses 20 to 22. But notice, in verses 20 uh, specifically, he says, a crooked heart does not discover good. Why? There is no way it is going to discover good because it is crooked. It is seeking that which is not good. And the only thing that is good is that which wisdom will lead us towards. Therefore, if we do not seek wisdom and we seek things that are crooked in that sense, 
what results out of such pursuit is sorrow. And then it goes on to say, and one with dishonest tongue fails, falls into calamity. So a crooked heart, a dishonest tongue, leads the one who has such to fall into calamity. He will find trouble just following him every day, every time. And perhaps he may be asking himself, why me? Why is it that I'm the only one who is troubled in such a sense, in such a manner? But notice the result of such trouble is because of a crooked and a dishonest life. Friends, therefore, the, the writer here, Solomon, is reminding us, especially as believers, that there is a certain way that befits one who is a believer. We must live a honest life. We must also live a straight life, a straight path that the scripture calls us to. That is the wisdom that we have seen so far. The beginning of wisdom basically is the fear of God. And when we fear God, we will walk according to his ways. We will shun evil. We will flee away from any form of things that will cause us to be dishonest in our life. And we will choose to live by the truth which God gives us um, in his word and in his son, Jesus Christ. But notice verse 21. He who serves a fool gets himself sorrow. And the father of a fool has no joy. It basically has the idea that the one who gives birth to a fool has no joy. Now, why is it that, maybe let, let's, let's talk back. Who is a fool in this sense? Is it somebody who's not gone to school? Would we consider somebody who's not gone to school as a fool, according to this context? No, I don't think it's, it's nothing to do with our academic levels. It's nothing to do with that. It is more to do with wisdom that comes from God. It is more to do with the fear of the Lord and living according to God's precepts. So notice then, let's, let's, let's translate it in that manner. The one who gives birth to a person or a son who do not fear the Lord brings sorrow to himself and the father of a fool has no joy. How will do we equate, equate sorry, um, the idea of one being called a fool here and the joy that should be among us. How old do we equate that? I don't know whether that question makes sense or I'm confusing you the more. How old do we um, say that one who do not fear the Lord, who the Bible calls here a fool, who would not bring joy to his family members? What are some examples that we can think of that um, is very obvious that would help us see how a fool or one who lives without the fear of the Lord brings no joy to his family. I hope that now makes more sense. Any, 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 any point, any, any examples that you may have? I know we, we have numerous of such examples. I will just want to hear two or three uh, so that we can clarify this portion and and understand what it's saying. Anyone else? Anyone who wants to try? Mr. Sagini, let me volunteer you. they will bring worry and um, there will be no joy in that home because they have chosen a path that is not the right path. They have chosen to live in sin and to do things opposite according to what perhaps the father is teaching in that sense. It brings joy. Now let's, let's, let's bring that to our great God. He has created us to be his children 
and he's called us to be his children, and he expects us to live according to what he has presented to us, right? But do we often follow the precepts of the Lord so that the Lord is joyous as he sees his children walking in his way? I think, I hope you get the point, the, the, the clarity and the example there. So the Lord will be pleased when we are living in obedience to him. But so often, you and I are always living in rebellion to this God. And therefore, if we use these Psalms, these Proverbs rather, perhaps the Lord is not pleased with our way of life. And therefore, he is encouraging us this morning that we have to. Not that he will do things that will make us um, not that our actions will change who God is, no. But the idea there is that just like a father will be sorrowful when they watch at their son living uh, uh, in, a, in an awkward way, living a life that is not pleasing to God, the same way our great God will not be pleased when he watches us living such a manner of life. The verse 22 says, a joyful heart is good medicine, but crushed spirit dries up the bones. A joyful heart is good medicine. Now, why do we take medicine when we are sick? Why do we take medicine? Yes, Sarah. To get better, it heals us from whatever disease that we, we were having. Here we are told that when there is joy, the bones are not dry, it's healed up, it is functioning well. There is kind of a good spirit towards whatever we are doing, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. So, therefore, as we think about this section, we have seen three things that bring sorrow according to Proverbs chapter 17 verse 20 to 20 to 1 is a crooked and a dishonest life brings sorrow to the heart. Um, we have also seen that when a foolish son will also bring sorrow to his father because as he watches his life, he is not seeing a life that is patterned after Christ, a life that is lived in honor of God. He's seeing a life that is lived in selfishness, a life that is lived um, to please uh, self and to have self-gain in that sense. And then we've seen, lastly, um, too much discouragement will also bring um, sorrow to the heart. Any question up to that point? Any question? We are following? The next thing that we see then in, uh, again, Proverbs 17, verse 28. Uh, let's read from verse 27 and 28. What we will see in this section, so the first section is about what brings sorrow. This second section we see uh, restrained speech um, is equated to wisdom. When we restrain our speech, that the scripture equates to one who is wise in that sense. Um, verse 27 and 28, let me read that uh, so that we move faster. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool who keeps silent in, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Notice in this section, uh, Solomon wants us to see that when we restrain our, our, our lips, when we restrain what we are saying, it is equated to wisdom. Does this mean then that we should not talk so that we are equated to be people of wisdom? Is that the, the point here? Is it that we just shut our mouth completely, don't talk, don't say anything, then you are a wise man. Is that the, the thing? Sometimes, yes. I, I, I agree, I agree. But is it complete silence? It's not complete silence. But sometimes you need to keep quiet because um, 
if you argue with a fool, for instance, who will be considered a fool in that sense? It is you, right? So sometimes there is wisdom in keeping quiet. But, the, but Solomon wants us to see here that whoever restrains, to restrain means to, to, it is not to completely stop, to ensure that you guard yourself, you ensure that you, you only speak when it is necessary, you strain, you avoid unnecessary communication that will lead you into um, sin. So he says, whoever restrains his words has knowledge. Now that's, that's, that's a bit tricky, right? When you restrain your words, you have knowledge. And in this sense, what we are told here, and he who has a cool spirit, I like that word, a cool spirit, how do we define a cool spirit? I know we, we like to use the word cool sometimes to say uh, it's, it's good, it's good. So who, he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Then verse 28 says, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Where there are many words, there is always going to be a bound of where we will end up speaking unnecessarily and perhaps saying something that will be hurting others, saying something that is not true, and saying something that will lead us to sin. And so um, we are told here that we must practice the restraint of our speech. And in so doing, we are displaying the wisdom that God has given us in that sense. Any question in that point? Notice verse 14, verse 14. The beginning of strife is like letting out water. So quite before the quarrel breaks out. So quiet, I, I don't know whether that is quiet or, qu or, or quit, sorry, quit. The beginning of strife is like letting out water. So quit before the quarrel breaks out. Now I want to give us an illustration. Think of a fountain. Uh, these fountains that are built uh, to kind of, uh, there is a continuous flow of water. And so there is a barrier to the water that is there. When you break that barrier, what happens? What happens? Will the water be contained in the place that it's supposed to be? It will flow all over, right? And that's the, the essence there, that um, the beginning of strife is like letting out water. If the ocean bursts its, uh, its water, uh, the, the, the tides are so heavy and it overflows, the destruction that water would bring is really great. And we can observe when we think about the lower areas of Kenya where there is always floodings whenever there is heavy rains we have witnessed and seen how water is destructive. And so this is equated even to words will be that destructive. Therefore, the need for restraining our words so that we are not affecting others, so that we are not sinning, so that we are deemed and considered men and women of wisdom. It is telling us, quit before quarrel breaks out. So when you are sensing that a quarrel is going to come, the Proverbs is telling us, if you are a man who of wisdom, quit, leave, flee away before it breaks out, because when it breaks out, it will be out of control. Perhaps you will not be able to control yourself. Notice the next chapter, uh, Proverbs 18, verse 4. It says, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. And again, those are to illustrate the idea of restraining our speech. Any question up to that point before we move to the next thing? So we've seen two things so far. 
we have observed what brings sorrow to the heart or to our soul in that sense. These are a crooked and a dishonest life, a foolish son, and too much discouragement. We have also seen the need to restrain our speech, which in this case is equated to one who has understanding, one who is a wise man. The next thing that we want to see, and in Proverbs 18, verse 28, 23 to up to Proverbs 19, verse 4, which will not read the all of those verses, is the idea of friendship, the idea of companionship. And, and so let's turn to Proverbs 18, verses 23. Let's pick it up from a, a very known verse for for, for that is always quoted, especially in weddings. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. The poor uses use entreaties, but the rich answer roughly. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Let's pause there. The idea here that the Solomon wants us to see is he wants his son to be that good friend to whoever they are friends with. And this good friend is a friend who sticks closer, who is there for their brother and sister, who is available um, even when they are uh, inconveniences in that sense. And so uh, what we observe here is the idea that as you think about our relationships, there must be genuine friendship that develops in those relationships. And so we are told a man of many companions may come to ruin. And again, not only are we to consider being good friends, but it also helps us to watch and to be careful who becomes your friend. Now, this is not an idea of saying, I don't want many friends. No, it is the idea of making sure that you surround yourself with people who will impart wisdom in your life, with people who will be able to encourage to walk with you even in difficult moments. But also a caution that we should examine ourselves and ask ourselves, what kind of a friend am I to my friend here and to my friend there and to my friend there? In, so it is a two-way traffic. As we examine those that should be our friends, we examine our own hearts and ask ourselves, who would we be that friend that sticks closer than a brother? Any question up to that point? Any question? Now, as, as we think about the world around us, who seems to have so many friends and who seems to have very few, if, if for that matter, or perhaps no friends at all? Think about our societies. Let's start with who has so many friends. Any ideas? Or maybe you don't live where I live. Uh, in this world that I live, that I am able to observe those with so many friends. Let me hear from us. Who has many friends in this world today? It doesn't have to be a name, but uh, an example. Politicians. Politicians is a friend of everyone, and especially when they are coming to seek for your votes. They become your very close, true friends who knows your need, who wants to be there for you, who is able to go into their pocket and dish some money to you because they want to portray the idea they are really your friends. But they are they to be, as we look at that practice, in the reality, are they your friends? Are they the friends of these many people that they claim to be their friends? They are not, right? 
Perhaps they don't even know them. They may only know a name, but they don't know them intimately and know that this person is in need of such. This person is of this strength in that sense. And so that kind of a friendship is a friendship that is seeking something from you. It's a friendship that is drawn based on the fact that there's something that they will get from you. Well, who else has many friends apart from politicians? What other term would we give to one with many friends? Hmm? You're thinking loud. <laughs> Please say it. Sorry? Mzungu. Mzungus will have so many friends. And, and when, when you drive into somewhere where people don't know you, you'll just hear Jambo, Abari. They are running to you because they... Why, why do they have so many friends? They are deemed to have what? They have money. And, and that led me to where I was leading us to. Those that are rich have many friends. And these friendships are only based on the fact that people are coming because they have money. But think about that man that people despise in the society. Perhaps the only friends they have is just the immediate family members. People don't even think about them. People don't even go to them. And so um, the idea here is that a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, I want us to talk about the friend who sticks closer than a brother. What is in our perception? What do we think this friend is? What are some of the qualities of such a friend uh, who sticks closer than a brother? And then at the end, I will ask us a very intimate question in relation to that very thing that we, we want to discuss. Give me some examples of a friend who sticks closer than a brother. How will we describe such a person? Any idea? Yes, Lydia. One who is very loyal. One who is very loyal. They are willing to be woken up in the middle of the night for the sake of their friend. They are loyal to their friend in that matter. Who else is a friend who sticks closer than a brother? Any idea? Any idea? We don't have friends who stick closer to us than brothers. One who is willing to go through a hard times just for the sake of a friend. That's a friend to keep. That's a friend to um, embrace. That's a friend to cherish. That's a friend to pray that the Lord will shower you with such friends who are loyal and who will go through hard time just to be with us. Now, I want us to bring this to what our Savior has done to us. He has called us, who are his enemies, his friends. And he came down to us to be a man like us, to be reviled, to be told all kinds of words that the Pharisees said to our Savior. And the goal is to show us that love is genuine, that love is not discriminating. And Christ has bought us so that those who are his enemies are now his friends, are now co with him, are now living to be with him. So as we think about a friend who sticks closer than a brother, I said earlier that I want to ask us, um, we don't have to answer this publicly, but I want you to examine yourself and ask yourself, would you be considered such a friend who is loyal as Lydia has told us, 
who is willing and able to go through hard times, not for his sake, but for the sake of a brother, for the sake of a sister, and um, for the sake of honoring Christ who has called us to do so. Who would you be that a friend? Who would you consider yourself such a friend? Who would you pray that the Lord will make you such a friend? Notice, when we compare this, we, what we see here is that as we seek wisdom that God gives, he gives us in return a way in which we can live and interact with one another. So any question before I summarize what we have learned so far? Any question? Any question? Are we following? Are we following? Good. So we've seen so far what brings sorrow to our hearts, and we've said that a crooked and a dishonest life will bring sorrow, not only to your own heart, but to the people around you. We have seen that a foolish son who will bring um, sorrow to his father and not joy, and we've seen that when we are faced with too much discouragement, sorrow will be a resultant of such a lifestyle. We've also seen the second thing, that restrained speech is basically equated to wisdom. Therefore, the call here is that we watch our words, we examine what we say, and we don't just speak a thousand words that at the end are meaningless, but you'd rather speak one word that will build and encourage your brother, your sister. We have looked at the idea of friendship and companionship, and uh, the Proverbs here reminds us that a man of many companions comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And I want to implore all of us, myself included, to strive to be this friend who is loyal, this friend who is able to go through hard time for the sake of his brother, for the sake of his sister. Let's move to the next, the next thing in Proverbs 19. We have a few minutes and so I think we are on good time. On Proverbs 19 verse 2 specifically, would someone read that for us? Proverbs 19 verse 2. Yes, yes. 19 verse 2. So the idea there is there is a desire for us to seek knowledge. And so in my version it says desire without knowledge is not good. So in whatever else that we desire, we must ensure that there is knowledge, which in this case is wisdom that will help us to pursue that very desire, but also to see what perhaps is not wise for us at that very moment. But notice it goes on to say, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. When a man's folly brings this, his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. Um, wealth brings many new friends, but a poor man is deserted by his friends. Notice verse three, when a man's folly brings his way to, um, when a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. Now I want us to think about, especially when we go through hard times, the first question that we ask ourselves and probably ask God, not ourselves, is God, why me? That's a very common question, right? 
When things are not going your way, the question is, why me? But yet God tells us and reminds us in his word that he brings everything our way for our own sanctification to help us get to a point where we can trust and fully trust the God uh, who has allowed these things. And so Proverbs here reminds us of the need to slow down on what we are doing. Slow down. Notice desire without knowledge is not good. So whatever else that we are desiring, we need to slow down. We need to think through it. We need to uh, do all kind of due diligence to ensure that as we desire, we are asking ourselves, is it according to knowledge? In other words, the scriptures that gives us knowledge, that gives us wisdom, must be what we inject into our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord in that sense. So the question here is, we are God's people. How can we rule our desires with wisdom? How can we rule our desires with wisdom? How can we stop hurrying up after things, hurrying up our, after our own desires and slow down and rule that very desire, that very want with God's word? Who wants to try? How can we rule our own desires with wisdom in that sense? We have to be in the word. Thank you. There is no better wisdom that we can attain in this world than the wisdom that has been given to us by our God. We have to be in the word. Friends, so many often we are carried away by the events of our lives and we forget to be in the word. When you are walking along the streets and somebody just passes and slaps you, what's your natural reaction? It's to retaliate, to bring it back, to ask this person, do you know the person you've just slapped? I will deal with you. And that's the natural man in us. But the idea here is we are asked to slow down. We are asked to be in the word and allow God's word to speak to our every circumstance around us. How else can we rule our desires with wisdom? How else? Seeking godly counsel, in other words, being in the life of one another so that we can be encouraged by how they are living their lives, so that they can point the wrongs in us and help us to live in a manner that pleases the Lord. One last, how do we rule our desires with wisdom? Who wants to try before we move to the last thing? wants to try? How do we rule our lives? Yes, Esther. Pray. Prayer is the only way that God has asked us to be in communion with him. Not that by reading his word we can't be in communion, but prayer is a means by which we can come to our great God and tell him of how inadequate we are in our lives. Tell him of how needy we are, but also adore and praise him. Friends, it is very sad that every week we, um, we remind ourselves of the fact that we have prayer meeting. Come join us online so that we can pray together. But how many of us take that moment to pray together with the saints, to stand on the gap before those that are needy and wanting, and also to pray for our own selves in that sense? Prayer is a way in which we can rule our desires and seek the Lord's grace even as we do so. The last thing that I want us to do is to look at Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22 verse 11 specifically and I would want somebody to read for us that portion. 
22 verse 11. Anyone? Yes, Lydia. He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. Imagine if you, you were called the close friend of the president, because that's a king in, in this context. You will feel you are somebody important, right? But notice, he... Um, who loves purity of heart, whose speech is gracious, will have a ki the king as his friend. Now, I want us to look beyond just the earthly king, okay? And look at the great king. And in Proverbs 21, he's been talking about our authority in, in that sense, how the Lord is able to rule the king and to turn their actions according to his ways. But in this section, he's saying, he whose words is gracious, remember what we saw earlier, one who restrains his words is considered one who is wise. And so here we are told, the one who loves purity of heart, and I think we've talked about that in many ways, and whose speech is gracious, will have the king as his friend. Notice verse 12. The eyes of the Lord keep watch over the knowledge, but he overthrows the words of a traitor. The sluggard says, there is a lie on outside. I shall be like, I shall be killed in the streets, and therefore they refuse to do anything because of excuses. But the idea here is, we must seek and desire to be pure in our heart. We must seek and desire that our speech will be gracious. Paul will say in Colossians, seasoned with salt, because as a gracious speech is not just sweet, but it builds, it encourages, it uh, helps us to walk in a manner that pleases the Lord. And friends, as we and today, any question before I give us one application that I would want us to, to close with? Any question, any comment, any addition? Notice as we end today, we who are God's children, who desire to be his intimate friends, we must do two things. One, we must choose this God to be our refuge, the one we run to, the one we depend on, the one we seek to the best of our knowledge. Notice Proverbs 18 verse 10 says, <coughs> Proverbs, <coughs> excuse me, Proverbs 18 verse 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and he is safe. The name of the Lord is like a strong tower. If this whole building was just held by one tower and part of the building was collapsing, all of us will run to this one tower because we know that section would not collapse down. There is refuge, there is safety in that section. Friends, as we seek to live lives of wisdom, there is only one source, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our desire on how to live this wisdom must be sought in him. We must have him as our refuge. The second thing that I want us to close with is the idea of faithfulness. So not only having Jesus as our refuge, but having uh, ourselves being faithful to that which the Lord has called us to do. Being faithful to that which the Lord has called us to do. 
Sorry. Notice Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, and that will be the last proverb we read today. Proverbs 20, verse 6 says, Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. And the idea here is, as we seek to display the wisdom that God gives us, would we be that faithful man, that faithful woman, that faithful child for the little ones that will be different from the people around them? You see, wisdom is supposed to be lived out. Wisdom is supposed to be seen by the people around us. If we have chosen the path of wisdom, if we stay in the word, if we pray to God, if we are honest and continue to seek what God desires of us, then faithfulness must be the reality that is observed. Not that we, we display or we, we hammer on people, but that is observed without us even saying, seeing or saying. Many, a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. Here's my prayer for all of us and for myself included. That as people in my circles will look at me, as people in your circles will look at you, they will see one thing, a faithful servant. A faithful servant of God. Because such is hard to find. But also, who makes us faithful is the king who is our friend. If we are the friends of the king, of this king, King Jesus, he calls us to be faithful to him, to his word, to the people around us. So friends, who do you desire this faithfulness or this attribute, a faithful man, so that in many words we may desire to describe ourselves but that will not suffice. What will suffice is that we are observed as faithful men, faithful women who love and serve their God. Friends, that is what wisdom will lead us to. That is what the Lord desire of us. And I pray that you and I will be that man and that woman who is found to be faithful. Jesus will, end, will tell us as we end today, that many would come to me, Lord, Lord, we did this, 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 this in your name. But on that day, those that were not faithful will be brought to shame. Would he welcome us and say, welcome my good and faithful servant. And that doesn't mean you have to have a bigger title, or you have to be a greater person in whatever area that you are. But in the little things that is given you, are you faithful? Let me apply that home. Are you faithful as a member of RBC in what the Lord has called you to do? Are you faithful as a husband, as a wife, as a child, as a son and a daughter to your parents? Are you faithful in the things that the Lord has called you to do. That's what wisdom will lead us to be. So our prayer this morning is that the Lord will lead us to be faithful servants in all walks of our lives as we trust him, as we hold him as our refuge in that sense. Any question? Maybe something has come up in your mind that you want to encourage us with in light of what we've studied. Any question? Okay. Let's close in prayer then, and then we will take one minute. It's already three minutes past ten, and so we need to close and begin our worship. So let's pray and ask God's grace and wisdom even in this. Our Father, we are thankful again for your grace, your love, your care. This morning you have taught us to be a people who 
who will bring joy to your side and joy to our, our fellow brothers and sisters. Lord, will you help us that we who live according to your word, according to knowledge, according to your wisdom. Lord, you have taught us also that we are supposed to restrain our lips so that we can speak words of wisdom that will encourage and build one another. Forgive us in many ways that we have not done so. Lord, you've reminded us of a need to be that good friend who will stick closer than a brother. Would you help us that that will be fostered amongst us, that will be fostered in our families, and that Christ, who is our great example, teach us <coughs> to be good friends. Lord, help us that we will hold you as our refuge, that we will seek to be faithful to you in our walk with you. Pray as we begin our worship this morning, we seek wisdom that comes from above. Lord, your word tells us if we lack it, we should ask. And therefore we are asking that you provide and give us wisdom to know how to live our lives. Bless our time together as we worship you in songs, as we listen to the preaching of your word. Be glorified today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.